well, good for weather, so great weekend. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about medieval and colour, and specifically looking at their protective functions. So I know today's focus is mainly on magical house protection, but I'm going to stretch this a little bit further and look at personal protection as well, um, and how this also incorporated into communal protection too. So my main objective would be to show that these objects, how they demonstrate a clear link between magic, religion and medicine in the Middle Ages, and also show that beliefs in Ampoli as protective objects and how they were widespread across medieval society. So today we're going to be concentrating on the material object as a source as well, um, and one reason for this is there's not a lot of textual information on Ampoli, so we're going to be looking at the object itself, which we can actually get quite a lot from. So I'm a huge fan of working with material sources, and I think they can give you a lot of extra insights into the beliefs and practices of the period. So for example, when examining these types of objects, we are able to see signs of use, which can tell us an awful lot about the object, rather than just reading about them in a textual source. So another area of interest to me as well is also the everyday life and the ordinary, ordinary experiences of people. And the history of the ordinary is quite a growing field at the minute, and one that benefits greatly, I think, from the use of material sources. So that's how we're going to look at it today as well, through that focus. So I think textual sources can sometimes restrict our view to the lives of just the literate people and the extraordinary examples of things. So the material use of material sources today is going to help us view objects that people would have come into contact with on a daily basis. And through these objects, we can view the everyday lived experiences of these people. And I really are a great source to help us investigate this in society in this way. And these are an object that demonstrate the everyday beliefs and practices in the medieval world. So I thought I'd start with a brief overview of uh, what an amphibian is, for those of you that don't know. Um, they were sometimes called pilgrim budgets, so we're quite a great setting for this being in Salisbury today, one of the pilgrim centres. Um, souvenirs or pilgrim signs. Um, Brian Spencer, he argues that these were one of the most common medieval <coughs> amulets, and they were usually made of tin, lead alloy, or poor quality pewter. So pilgrimage, in the 14th century had grown to something of a social event, a mixture of piety and tourism mixed together. And much like we do today, when people visited a shrine, they wanted a souvenir or something to take back to show that they'd been on a trip, and they wanted evidence of this. So this is what one use and one function of what these objects were. <coughs> so pilgrim centres, <coughs> such as Beckett Shrine in Canterbury and Our Lady of Walshingham, they started to manufacture and sell these objects as cheap souvenirs. Um, there's some ampullas are some of the first examples of these types of objects. And as you can see, um, this is what they look like. And as you can see from the image there, like a miniature flask. Um, and they were designed for carrying water and other liquids from the shrine. So the holy liquid would then be put in these and then be taken away. So the souvenirs could provide the wearer with some sort of protection. So not only did they also prove that they were on a pilgrimage, but also they were signs of the wearer's devoutness, so that they were outward sign of protection as well. However, their popularity really rested on the notion that the object had actually been sacralised at a shrine, either by being touched to the shrine or touched to the relics. And in the case of the Ampulla, it was by the holy liquid that they carried inside them. And by this process of sacralisation, they became a potent wonder-working object. And today we're going to be specifically focusing on our pulley from two different shrines. So we've got two related to Thomas Beckett, and two related to Our Lady of Wilson's Shrine in Norfolk. So we're going to concentrate on the relationships between protection, magic, religion and medicine. So this first set of our are located with the Thomas Beckett Shrine in Canterbury. So this one from Lincolnshire was found in the, uh, and this one from Kent, and they're both dated from the 13th to the 14th century. And they're both shaped in that style of the miniature flask, and then they're lead. So the Lincolnshire and uh, has a moulded letter T on the website. <coughs> so it's quite hard to make out as it's written in the black letter. Um, so this is our example of the black letter T here, and then we can see the letter T on here. Um, and it's also got a successful <coughs> figure, so we think perhaps this may be something to do with Thomas Beckett, but linking both of these to Beckett's shrine. So to really understand how these worked, I'm going to give you some context on Thomas Beckett for those of you that aren't, aren't experts in this area. He, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury in the 12th century, 
he was assassinated in a bloody and brutal murder at Canterbury Cathedral. And he was then venerated as a martyr and canonised. So when Beckett died, the monks at Canterbury collected his blood and they discovered that the water tinged with his blood when taken as a draught or applied as a lotion could bring about a miraculous cure. So the water of St Thomas was reputed to cure a wide range of illnesses and disabilities. So one woman claimed she was cured of a disfiguring abdominal growth. And this news spread quite fast and within three months people were travelling to collect back of water. Soon almost every church in England had a sample of this water to use in times of crisis. And Canterbury then began producing these ampulla in large numbers as souvenirs. And Canterbury was the first to mass produce these in tin. And some even had slogans <laughs> such as Beckett is the best doctor of the worthy sick, reflecting their medicinal properties and also the fact that it was only the worthy that could possibly be cured. <laughs> so both of these ampullas show signs of use. The Lincolnshire ampulla in particular, we've got an example here of how the water was pierced, how it was pierced mm -hmm. to let the water out. And the Kent example, just here, this is a small hole at the bottom. Um, and this is also where the water would have been released as well. So I think it's quite interesting by using the material object, not only are we actually seeing the object itself, but we're also seeing how it's used uh, and how the object was used by people in the past. Beckett's wasn't the only shrine in England, um, once also in one very popular to Canterbury, second in fact to Canterbury was Walsham in the <coughs> So this shrine was linked to the Virgin Mary and the water here was taken from a holy well. And this second set of ampullas that we're looking at are dated for, again, from the 13th to the 14th century. This one from Hertfordshire and there's one from Lincolnshire. Both have associations with Walshingham. The Hertfordshire ampulla is decorated with a W and with a crown. And the Lincolnshire, this represents perhaps Our Lady of Heaven. And the Lincolnshire example, we have a lily. Uh, engraved on the front, which is the Marian emblem, representing the purity of the Virgin Mary. So many who travelled to Walshingham Shrine would have been seeking help from the Virgin Mary, and mainly for help with contraception, for carrying children, and the safe delivery of a child. So we can see, again, how the Impula have been used. So it's a small hole, again, at the bottom of the Hertfordshire example, and particularly evident in the Lincolnshire example, the object's actually been torn at the neck, it's actually been torn and then used and thrown away. Another shrine as well that is also little known, I thought was quite interesting. Um, we've got some examples that are surviving from here. Um, St William of York Minster. And this is one of the panes of stained glass that depict the life and death of St William. And in it we can see the pilgrims collecting water from the tomb. Uh, one man is rubbing the water on his face, I think that's this one, this one here. And uh, the other one is that we can see he's actually got an object here that he's using, he's actually collecting it in, which is probably an apple that he's using. Um, and examples, uh, so we can assume this is an apple and here we can actually see it in use, which is really nice to see. So William was canalised in the 13th century, um, when a clear sweet smelling liquid began to pour from his tomb. And it was believed to have miraculous healing and protective properties. So examples include a woman whose sight was restored and people who quickly recovered from illnesses once they had come into contact with this liquid. And it became so popular that spigots were actually fitted to the tomb so that there was really easy access for people to get to this water. Um, St William, however, did not re reach the same dizzying saintly heights as Thomas Beckett and Our Lady of Walshingham. But I thought it was just useful to demonstrate that the beliefs were happening all over the country and in varying scales. And the stained glass window, I think, also shows the popularity of the impulas and that they were pictured in a religious piece of art produced in the 15th century. So again, we're talking a couple of centuries later after they reached the heights of their beliefs. Um, shows that they were still recognised. They were still recognised as a protective object. Um, and also is evidence of how they were used. Um, and we've got a different type of material source to depict the object. So we're going to look at the protective functions of them in three ways. So we've got personal protections, protection of property, and communal protection. So the main use of Ampulla for personal protection would have been for medicinal use. Ampulla were designed to be worn around the neck. 
and the belief was that once you had collected the miraculous substance, you could then use it as you wished. So the liquid and the vessel could also be used separately. Some used it as a personal safeguard against evil and would continue to wear the ampulla around their necks after the water had been used. Not only protecting themselves, but again, they're also showing this outward sign of devotion. And the power wasn't just restricted to the pilgrim. The water could be used as a medicine for their sick friends or relatives who couldn't make the pilgrimage. And we know that the water from Beckett's tomb was renowned for its medicinal properties. And the water from Our Lady of Walshingham's was often used for issues of fertility. And again, we've got another example. Oops. <laughs> Also, stained glass windows. This is at Trinity Chapel at Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and this also depicts a miracle of William Fitz Elsif, who was healed by Becket Water. And the Apollo has been used to administer this cure. But I don't know if you can really see on here, the actual size of it is huge. It's bigger than, than the man's head. It's been healed. <laughs> they weren't that big. <laughs> um, but I think that's perhaps something to do with uh, it's depicted so big to show its capacity. So it's to show that it was an object larger than life, it was an object that can heal, it was a holy object, and that it offered protection. So it had many functions. <coughs> now we also find, uh, oh, this one right we also find a reference to an uh, ampulla being used in historical fiction. So I think it's a nice example of engaging with a little bit of public history. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this book, any of you have read it, we're all here today because we're interested in witches and magic and witchcraft. It's a brilliant book, um, and it's definitely worth a read if you if you like this sort of thing. But I actually read this when it first came out back in 2011, um, before I had any idea that I was actually going to give up my fairly decent job and become a mature student and go back and start learning all about history at Exeter. Um, so I had no idea what it was when this reference came up. I didn't know. Um, and I also didn't know back then that you could study witchcraft and magic as a topic, so that was really exciting when you could go to university and actually do that. Um, my mum was actually reading this at the minute, and before I came, she said to me, do you know there's an ampulla in this book? I, said, no, I didn't know. I went back and I found the reference. Um, one of the main characters in the book actually carries one for his own personal protection. Um, so if we use our imagination a little bit here, Matthew, in the book, the main character is actually a vampire. So be quite the um, he's a time travelling vampire as well, just to add to that. <laughs> Bear with me. It is a good book, honestly. <laughs> but he actually purchased a coffin shaped ampulla from Lazarus's shrine in Bethany. Um, and putting aside the time travelling vampire part of Matthew, um, he actually uses his ampulla like an ambulance. And he reaches for it when in times of need, in times of protection, and when he wants to use it, and in times of difficulty. And he's represented as a man of deep faith, but also as a man of science in the book, which I think nicely shows how these beliefs could be intertwined in the medieval periods, and will continue to be believed in the later periods. And that Ampulla could be used as a form of protection, and how it will continue to be used as a form into the early modern periods as well. So back to the more serious side of it. All, all four of our ampullae show signs of use, and we can clearly see in each case where the liquid has been removed, um, perhaps for medicinal reasons and as a form of protection, as we've discussed. And as mentioned earlier, once the holy liquid was sealed into the ampulla, it became one with the vessel, making it a devotional object. So once this liquid had been used, the ampulla could then serve by itself as a protective object. So this is where we find Ampulla being used as for protection of property, and it was used on property from buildings to livestock. So they'd be hung in sheds, in barns, and in stables to protect animals from untoward threats, such as illnesses and disease, and also from threats of witchcraft. They've also been found nailed up in homes, suggesting that they were used as a protective device for the building and for those within it. And they've also been found in foundation deposits under houses further supporting the idea of Ampulla providing protection for a building. Some Ampulla have also been found with holes poured through the centre, indicating that they were mounted. And this damage, I think, is one of the clearest indications that Ampulla were used as objects of ritual and magic. 
Some have been found in sacred, spa sacred spaces such as churches. Uh, they were even embedded in church bells. <coughs> this built on the belief that loud noises could ward off demons or bad weather. And they've also been found mounted in uh, communal objects such as prayer books and also in manuscripts such as the Deuce manuscript had at the body in library. This unfortunately isn't a picture of that because I'm going to get hold of one, but it's an example of what it may look like. They're also depicted in medieval manuscripts such as this 14th century manuscript. <coughs> and here we've actually at the top, we've got the dove and he's bringing the ampoli to the baptism of King Clovis I. And it's representing a object of holiness and playing a crucial role in the king's conversion to Christianity. So the fact that they were in sacred spaces and that they were accepted form of Christian magic also serving as a form of communal protection. Another form of communal protection can be seen situated in a more rural context. They're more commonly found in rural areas. So this map is using the data from the Portable Antiquities Scheme and it shows the distribution of ampullae across England and Wales. Uh, we can see the highest concentration of them are around this area is to the east, counties such as Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Yorkshire, Suffolk and Kent have the largest recorded numbers. And some have argued that this is due to the fact that they were highly populated areas and also that metal detecting is more practiced in these areas so they're more likely to be found. But another factor could also be that these were largely rural farming communities. So one argument is that the high presence of farmland is that the ampoule were used to bless the fields. So all four examples show the ampoule has been deliberately broken. And this coupled with the fact that the majority of ampoule were found deposited in farmland areas strengthens the likelihood that they were richly discarded. The holy liquid would have been sprinkled on crops to ensure a good harvest to cure failing crops, and even to protect their crops from more malign threats, such as inclement weather and threats of witchcraft. So they do appear to have been a rural phenomenon. As there is little textual evidence of them, we can only assume that the farmers had completed the pilgrimage themselves, had requested one to be brought back from their pilgrimage, or they bought one from the wandering pardoners that were quite often seen on the road at this time. Either way, it gives an insight into the medieval society and how these objects fitted into the everyday life of ordinary people, such as rural farmers. And due to the large numbers of these findings, it's evident that they were popular. Their cheap mass production shows that they were available to lower levels of society, and it's also evident they were used in certain ways to provide a particular protective or healing function. So from looking at the four different types, it's clear that they were multifunctional. They had amulesic properties in two ways, the substance they carried and the saint themselves. And they clearly show how magic, religion and medicine were linked. The water was clearly believed to have protective healing properties and it was used in various ways to cure the sick, particularly in relation to washing them and others helping women in childbirth. And they also served as protective objects, either personally, domestically or communally. An analysis of impure as a material object has shed light on aspects of late medieval culture and custom. And by viewing Ampoli as a votive material object, we've been able to gain access to religious practices, economic activity, supernatural beliefs, and elements of daily life in this period. By examining the object itself, we have also been able to determine that the object was used and how it was used. Comparing this with archaeological data, we're able to gain further insights into how it was used by tracing where they are found and in what quantities, giving us further insights into these everyday practices. So hopefully this paper has shown some of the advantages of using material sources to access daily life and has showcased what otherwise could be seen as a mundane, ordinary object, as a multi-layered, multifunctional object, which is a fruitful source for us as historians to pick apart. Thank you very much.